Всем привет! I'm Mariana, this is Impression Blend, and welcome to the spookiest month of the year. It's showtime. In today's weekly blend, I have an interesting selection of new chills and thrills for you. I think there's something for everyone here, so let's just get right into it. Finally, I got to see one of my most anticipated films of the year, which is also one of the most bizarre films of the year, Julia de Cournot's Titan. This one is only currently playing in theaters, and whether you'll end up hating it or loving it, it is absolutely worth the trip because it's an experience you are not likely to forget. This year's Palme d'Or winner at Cannes is a French body horror film about a female dancer and serial killer with a titanium plate in her skull who gets pregnant after having sex with a car. Yup, you heard that right. That's pretty much the setup. Well, okay, that's just the first half of the movie because really the story is about unconditional love, humanity, and found family. But I'm not going to talk about how the movie gets there because you can discover that when you actually watch it. What I will say though is that this movie is a shock to the system nothing can prepare you for. Now, I thought I was prepared for this to be pretty out there because I saw Ducourneau's previous film, Raw, and as some of you might remember, I love that film. Check out my video about why you should watch it if you haven't seen it yet. But Titan is quite a different beast altogether and its meaning is defined a lot less clearly than it is in Raw. Ducourneau plays with metaphors and contrasts while also blurring genre lines and gender lines, with the first half of the film sitting somewhere between slasher and body horror, along with some really dark humor, and the second half really leaning into a twisted allegorical drama. If it sounds like two different movies in one, that's kind of what it feels like watching it, and from my perspective, the second half of the film works better than the first. While I understand the point of this stark contrast and the director's desire to start with a very cold and unlikable character so she can then show her discovering her humanity, there is still a disconnect here. That first half left me with quite a few questions, most of which are along the lines of, I get what this means, but why? It almost felt like there's a scene or two missing somewhere to tie it all together, and while I can fill in the blanks with my own imagination, some of it gives too much room to project whatever you want onto it. On the other hand, this goes along with Julia Ducourneau's artistic vision. When talking about the film, she mentions she doesn't have a lot of interest in giving answers, as she believes the point of art is to raise questions and start a debate. From from that perspective, she absolutely succeeds. Titan is the type of film that can fuel endless discussions from its striking aesthetics to its themes of love, humanity, and transformation. Even the genre itself transforms throughout the film. It's tempting to say that it feels like something that could have been written by J.G. Ballard and shot by David Cronenberg, but Ducourneau's vision is too strong and distinct to attribute it to anyone other than her. Titan is definitely one of those films that was difficult for me to rate. I did not love it instantly like a lot of people did, but once the initial shock wore off and I was able to sit with it and think about what the director was trying to achieve here, I began liking it more and more. It's obviously stunning visually, even during the moments that will make you squirm. It's certainly impossible to look away from, aside from the squirming. It surprised me with how darkly funny it was at times, and it's undeniably thought-provoking. It's also imperfect, occasionally jarring, and as I already mentioned, the second half of it works better than the first. So in the end, for my rating, I am going with an 8 out of 10. I do think it's an incredibly interesting and unforgettable film that I keep wanting to come back to and analyze and discuss and find out more about. In a way, its imperfections and missing details go along Along with the idea of the lead character and her search for connection and humanity. Check this one out in theaters if you dare. 
Moving on to Netflix, the first thing I want to talk about is The Guilty, the American remake of a Danish thriller under the same title. This was actually one of the films I saw at TIFF this year, and as someone who really enjoyed the original film, I have some strong opinions about this one. The Guilty is a one-location thriller that centers around Joe, an LAPD officer who has been demoted to 911 call operator duty. As he's nearing the end of his shift, he gets a call from a woman who has been kidnapped, and now Joe wants to do everything he can to get her back to safety. As you have probably gathered from the trailer, this is 100% a Jake Gyllenhaal show. The movie never leaves the call center, and you're essentially watching him take stressful phone calls for 90 minutes. Listen, good remakes of foreign language films are rare, but they do exist. Films that are able to retain the essence of the original, but put the story into a new setting, adding some changes that make it feel fresh while also making sense. This remake of The Guilty is absolutely unnecessary. I know there are going to be people telling me, can't you just judge this movie on its own merit? And to that I say, no. I can't pretend this is an original movie when it's not, particularly when it's almost the same as the original. When I say almost the same, I am not exaggerating. It's almost word for word the same movie. Does it add anything to the original? There are some minor changes that actually make things a bit weaker. For example, you eventually find out why Joe has been demoted, and while in the Danish film you get a very clear picture of what happened and it's juxtaposed to something else in the movie, in the remake the character kind of mumbles through this. They make it personal because of course they do, and it just turns into a melodramatic moment. This, along with a couple of other minor things, make the movie less dark and less impactful, while also much muddying motivations for multiple characters. Obviously, since this is a one-location film, nothing is really done differently from the visual perspective, and it's not like they tried to go for anything creative with that one location either. It's pretty much on the shoulders of Jake Gyllenhaal to carry this film, which he does. And let's talk about that performance for a minute. Is Jake Gyllenhaal good in this movie? Yes, of course he is. However, there is one thing about the way he portrays this character that did not work for me. I am not sure if this is something that came from the director or from Gyllenhaal himself, but with his performance, he goes big and angry pretty much from the very beginning. Is he good at portraying that emotional state? Sure, but the problem is that this leaves almost no room for escalation. He just yells a lot for most of the film. There's a scene in the movie in which the character loses it to anger, and because the actor in the original film starts off with a very calm and collected, almost icy exterior, we watch his emotional state progress as he struggles more and more to keep it professional. So, when he loses it, this has an impact. When later in the film we see him get a bit more vulnerable and completely drop this facade, it has an impact. These same scenes do not work the same way when Gyllenhaal has been yelling and angry the entire movie. A lot of the tension is lost because of this. He does have some good scenes though, and he does hold your attention the entire time. Do not take this as me saying this is a bad performance. Gyllenhaal is really good in this role. I just think giving his emotional state some more range would have been a much more interesting choice. But yeah, this remake is exactly the kind of average, unnecessary remake we get most of the time. It's not incompetent, it's not actively bad, it's just not great and it doesn't do anything interesting with the original material. I think people who haven't seen the original film will enjoy this a lot more than people like me who have seen it and I'm pretty sure it's going to do well on Netflix in general, but it really did not do much and I am giving it a 5 out of 10. Please just go stream the Danish original on Hulu. It's a darker, more tense, better thriller. 
Now, something I wholeheartedly recommend you watch on Netflix this weekend is The Chestnut Man. You might remember me praising this Nordic noir thriller in the past, and yes, it is a miniseries adaptation of this novel, and it is really good. Now, this is a Danish miniseries, but, and this may sound crazy, the English dub is actually really solid. So if you don't feel like reading the subtitles for the entirety of this one, I can't can recommend the English dub. Obviously, the original sound and dialogue will always be better, but in this case, they did a really good job with it. It's not distracting, and I'm pretty sure the actual actors are the ones doing the English voiceover. I couldn't find any confirmation of this, so don't quote me on it, but if they are not, the voice actors they found sound exactly like the cast. The Chestnut Man is a chilling crime thriller that starts off with a brutal murder in a suburb of Copenhagen. Soon, the detectives investigating the case realize that they're dealing with a serial killer whose calling card is a chestnut man, a simple doll children make out of branches and chestnuts. What follows is an investigation full of twists and turns as detectives Thulin and Hess try to find the killer before it costs them another life. If you're someone who appreciates dark and atmospheric Scandinavian thrillers, this series is something you absolutely need in your life. It has everything you want from the genre. A complex story, surprising revelations, flawed characters, complicated family dynamics, crimes that get increasingly more gruesome, and of course, moody autumnal Scandinavian visuals as the story unfolds in October. It's a very engrossing, stylish, and gloomy crime thriller that I've seen almost no marketing for, which is a shame because this is easily one of the best series within the genre that I've seen in a very long time. What always appeals to me in Nordic Noir is its lack of interest in sugarcoating anything or in sensationalizing anything. At its best, it's gritty without exaggerating it, it's violent without being gratuitous, and its lead characters are always tired and flawed. The Chestnut Man captures this essence of the genre perfectly, and for those of you who read the novel, it really nails the tone. The writing takes care to develop the characters, they feel like real people with real problems. Alongside the crimes, you'll find a look at relationships, balancing career and family, dealing with pain, the complexities of parenting, the fear of regret, this series is just as much character driven as it is plot driven and as you can imagine, this really appeals to my taste in storytelling. There really isn't much I can complain about here. Sure, there are some scenes where the pacing slows down a lot, some might say too much, but Honestly, that really fits the Nordic Noir genre. All of the performances were really good, even the kids, and even though I already knew the story, it was fascinating to watch the detectives take the case from the stage of nothing makes sense and slowly bring the threads together to form a complete picture. I'm going very high with my rating here. It's a 9 out of 10 for me. The Chestnut Man is a gripping, twisted, slow burn crime thriller that is absolutely going to be a treat for the fans of the genre. Also, obviously, I once again highly recommend the novel it's based on. Lastly, I wanted to briefly mention that I did check out the first two films in this year's Welcome to Blumhouse anthology, Bingo Hell and Black as Night, but that kind of over-the-top, intentionally ridiculous B-horror movie style is just not for me. I cannot recommend them, but I'm also not the target audience here, so if you enjoy that type of horror, you might want to check them out on Amazon Prime. I don't know. Personally, I will not be watching or covering the rest of the anthology because, as I mentioned, I am not the target audience here, so I don't think I have a lot to contribute when it comes to people who are actually looking for those types of movies. 
I'm not a fan, but maybe if you are, this might work for you. And that's it for this weekly blend. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you're planning to watch this weekend in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching this video. A special thank you to all my patrons with an extra special thank you to the patrons whose names are on the screen right now. Thank you so much for supporting me on Patreon and I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. I will see you very soon in my next video. Всем пока!